Good morning, everyone. Oh, now you hear me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are very honor honored to be here as part of uh, this great conference of uh, the IAC. Uh, this is my first time in, in this conference, and I see that uh, I understand that from each year it's getting bigger and bigger, and uh, I'm happy to be part of that. Uh, we have here uh, three entrepreneurs. I would like, first of all, to present them, and then we will start our uh, discussion. Uh, the first one, we start with uh, Michael Wittblatt, uh, founder and the CEO of uh, Forter, which deals with uh, fraud detection. Uh, Michael uh, is an example to an entrepreneur that lived in Tel Aviv, then moved to San Francisco, lived there for, lived there for two years, and in the last year, he relocated from San Francisco to New York. Um, Michael, welcome. Uh, can you say a few words about uh, yourself, your company, and about your journey in uh, the US? Sure. So good morning, everyone. First thing is, in the US, I'm actually Michael. <laughs> the best part about this name, it has a local version everywhere. Exactly. Um, so very happy to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me over. Uh, I'm pretty sure that everyone has here has a Few, at least a few credit cards, and everyone here try to buy something online. What you might not be aware of is every time someone else uses your credit card, which happens more often than you would think, uh, every retailer has to deal with it on their own. The liability is always there. It's not on the banks. It's not on you. So if fraud happens to you, you call the bank and you get paid. And what we found in our journey probably over 10 years ago in another actually quite an exemplary company in the, in the Israeli tech uh, scene called Fraud Sciences. In the book Startup Nation, that's the first company in the first chapter. We found that way more money is being lost because retailers are afraid of fraud than from fraud itself, right? The fear is worse than reality. And we looked for a way to restore the balance uh, of trust. It's, uh, amusingly, Dan Ariely spoke about this earlier. When you walk into a store, no one suspects that you will be, you'll commit fraud, and you don't suspect the store to commit fraud, even though there is way more fraud happening in stores just because the market's so much bigger than online. Uh, but we have this inherent trust that we don't have online because people can't see each other. And we've come, came up with, when we started Forder about four years ago, uh, we came up with a very simple idea that's based on a very, very complicated system behind it that we will review the transactions instead of a retailer's. We'll give them a simple yes, no answer without confusing them with indicators and scores and machine learning and other buzzwords. Uh, and if we said yes, so we approve the transaction that ends up being fraudulent, that's on us. Which is maybe something very, very Israeli to say a lie, <laughs> uh, which was a phrase we used a lot uh, when we started the company early on. Uh, but it, it solves all the issues that I've mentioned originally. They, retailers don't have to do it on their own, right? They don't have to hire the best talent because they're dealing with very, very sophisticated fraudsters. They don't have to invest in technology. They don't have to risk anything. And just to give you some perspective, online retailers in the US alone lose over $6 billion to fraud. About four of them are in traditional retail and two in airlines and other hospitality services. Uh, and about $20 billion of good transactions never take place because of that fear that I mentioned earlier. So when you make the decisions for them and you take the risk, the risk away, the marvelous thing that happens is their sales go up. And we all of a sudden turned a kind of a cybersecurity fraud prevention problem that stuck somewhere in finance into a revenue generation tool for all retailers. Uh, as I mentioned, we started the company about four years ago in Israel, moved around, we'll probably talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're now covering over $20 billion worth of online transactions, and we expect that number to grow substantially next year, with some of the top retailers in the US now starting to expand internationally as well. Great, thank you. I would like uh, to mention that uh, Michael, Michael, raised uh, $50 million from top uh, VCs, among them uh, Sequoia, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, good luck, and amazing achievement. Uh, I was Just a note, right? You, you create a really successful company, you build a great product, no applause. You raise a bunch of money <laughs> from some VCs, this is what gets people's attention. Uh, the world, <laughs> what a strange world. That's funny, that's correct. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Sharon Shacham, who founded uh, Cario Farm at 2008. 
Uh, the company went uh, public on 2013 on NASDAQ. Uh, Sharon is uh, based in uh, Boston. Uh, Sharon, please. Thank you. Thank you. So my field is a little bit better than his field. We are dealing with uh, other problem. I think um, in what I like about our field is that there are only good guys. I guess in Michael's field, there are the bad guys and the good guys. In, other, in, in, in my field, the bad guy is cancer. Um, and what we are doing at Cariofarm is we are trying to develop new medicine for cancer. Um, I think we are living in a, in a beautiful age um, of science. And the, the progress that we have seen in oncology uh, is, is amazing. And I believe that in 10 to 20 years, cancer will become a chronic disease. And I hope that Cariofarm and the drug that we are developing will be part of the um, armory that we have to find against cancer. This disease touches everyone we know. And what, if one of us, when you know someone that has uh, that had cancer, you hear a lot about chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, and until you talk to a patient and really experience what they are going through when they go to the clinic, they have a devastating disease. They have to sit any, anything between an hour to eight hours in the chemo chair connected to an IV and then go home. Um, they suffer from a lot of side effects. They lose their hair. Um, and and it's, it's really a barbaric experience. And I think all of us in biotech are determined to change how we treat cancer patients and hopefully to make sure that cancer patient will have a cure. Um, Selinexor is an oral drug, so if you'll think about a patient that needs to travel six hours to the clinic, he doesn't have to do it anymore because he can take the drug at home. Um, it also is targeted only the cancer cell and doesn't hurt the normal cells, so the side effects are much less. You don't lose your hair, you don't have damage to your heart, you don't have damage to the kidney, and it really provides a different experience and hope to cancer patients that otherwise have no other hopes. Uh, we have started uh, uh, Cariofarm at 2009. Um, my husband, Michael, that sits here, and the CEO likes to, do, to say that we did it in the kitchen, uh, mostly because I was having my chemicals, my original chemicals, uh, <coughs> sold in the fridge. <coughs> Um, the kids look fine, so I assume we didn't create too much damage by storing all these compounds in the refrigerator. Um, but since then, we, have, um, we did a Series A funding in 2010 mm -hmm. and started clinical trials with our lead compound, Selenexo, in 2012. This experience of giving something that never existed to a human is, is an amazing feeling. You'd stress, but when it passes and when the patient actually responds, it's probably the best feeling that um, I and my profession can achieve. Since then, we have treated over 2,000 patients um, across many cancers, from blood cancers to uh, brain tumors, um, colorectal, pancreatic, lung, um, and others. Um, not all of them are responding, uh, but some have responded and are being treated with the drug for over two years. Some are already off the drug, but still alive mm -hmm. due to the drug uh, for over two years. Um, and I think that's the, be the beauty of our field, um, is that if you do a good job, your investors are happy, your employees are happy, but most important, people are living longer life and have a better quality of life. If we do our job correctly, um, and I hope we will, the drug has its first chance to be approved as early as 2019, and if not, then probably around 2020. And then it will be uh, approved in the US, followed by several approvals um, in, in Europe and, and rest of the world. Thank you, Sharon. Um, the next panelist is Daniel. He sits here in uh, two hats. 
the first one is the managing partner of uh, Governing Dynamics. It's a VC investing in only in Israeli startups in rounds A and B. The second hat, which is the hottest topic today, which is the blockchain. Daniel is uh, the president and CEO of Celsius, uh, dealing with blockchain technology. Uh, Daniel, maybe you can uh, Thank you. talk about it. Uh, if you look at your programs, uh, the guy I was supposed to uh, sit here and talk to you today is Alex Mashinsky, my partner. But he's got uh, six kids, and when you have six kids, the probability that something is going to go wrong <laughs> increases dramatically. And that's why I have only one. Um, so I'm Daniel. I'm, uh, like I said, the managing partner of Governing Dynamics. We like to invest in, in Israeli companies and then help them scale in the United States. We've got a small office in Tel Aviv and an office in New York. It's a very small team that is looking at um, it's companies with cyber, AI technologies, now some blockchain, and we do have um, one biotech firm in, in our portfolio that we're very, very happy with its performance so far. Um, we'll talk more about that during the question and answer session, about what we're looking for when we invest in uh, Israelis and Israeli Americans and what we do for them when they come here and relocate from Israel to continue to scale their companies. Uh, my second hat, as Guy said, is I'm uh, the president of Celsius Network. Um, and Celsius is leveraging blockchain technology to build a more fair consumer credit uh, for people all around the world. How many of you own a credit card? Credit card? What's the average interest rate you pay on that credit card? Where? I'll, uh, where? where? Different. Different. <laughs> average. 15, 20 percent. Doesn't make sense. How much money are you guys making an interest on your savings at Chase and Wells Fargo. I'll help you, it's less than 1%. On that delta, JP Morgan Chase made $15 billion last quarter. Why? Because they can. Well, we're gonna change that. And that's exactly what we're doing at Celsius Network, building a more fair credit lending system, consumer credit lending system, that would give you, the lender, uh, a far higher percentage or interest rate on that loan that you would provide and the borrower um, a lower percentage rate and as a non-for-profit we will be taking part of that delta outside our profit and give it back to the community. That's what we're doing in Celsius. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I will say a few words about myself which relates to the topic of this panel and then we'll start with the questions. Uh, I relocated uh, from Tel Aviv to New York uh, almost six years ago, as part of uh, Ernst & Young, from Ernst & Young Tel Aviv to Ernst & Young in New York, to be an accountant uh, dealing with New York-based startups. And then I realized, I identified a trend of Israeli startups that are expanding from Israel to New York, but I couldn't find any resource or database online or offline that would map <coughs> them all. Uh, so I decided to help the community and I created an interactive map, a simple map with dots on it of the Israeli startups which are operating in uh, New York. I called it Israeli Mapped in New York. When I started with it five years ago, almost five years ago, uh, there were uh, exactly 56 Israeli startups on the map. And after it was published, suddenly it became 100 because all the entrepreneurs that worked from their home or, or Israeli entrepreneurs that no one know that they are working on something, reach out to me, added themselves to the map, and it became the main hub of Israeli startups that are operating in uh, New York. Uh, since then, the number uh, uh, grow every month, and today we are with almost 350 Israeli startups in uh, New York. Um, I, based on that platform, I created another one in Boston with over around 130 or 140 Israeli startups in Boston, and then another platform, Israeli Mapped in London. And what I'm trying to do in that, and that's not my day job, I try to help the, uh, to show the Israeli success to the world, and also to help the Israeli entrepreneurs uh, to be in touch with big corporates that they are looking for to be their uh, customers, to help them be in touch with the investors, and really to uh, create a community uh, that was not exist before. Um, and that was my, my main goal in that. Uh, since then, I left EY, and now I'm the general manager of SOSA New York. Uh, SOSA basically is a place where we connect between startups, investors, 
and global corporates that are looking for innovation. Most of our work is to connect these corporates that are our clients, if it's big banks, big insurance companies, big media companies, they are looking for new technologies and new innovation in order not to end up like Blockbuster or Kodak. So uh, we are working with them, they are our clients, and we connect them to Israeli technology in Israel and to startups in New York. It doesn't really matter if it's in Israel or not. And we are going to expand to some other location. We have a location in Tel Aviv, in New York, and we are going to expand to some other six uh, tech cities, I would call them. Um, so I identify this, all this number of Israeli startups that are expanding uh, um, from Israel to the US. Um, the number is, keeps growing every month. Uh, Michael is uh, three years in the US, two years in South San Francisco, and last year he relocated to New York. Daniel, almost 20 years in total in the US, and Sharon, 40, uh, 14 years? 15 winters. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so we have, a, 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 and I'm six years, so we have all these uh, kinds of uh, different uh, number of fields. I would like to ask the panelists, we start with uh, Michael, from your personal experience and journey, what are the unique skills, uh, skill sets and mind, mindsets that Israeli Americans bring uh, to entrepreneurship? What is unique about the Israeli entrepreneur? What is the secret sauce? Well, I think, since probably 100% of Israeli Americans started as Israelis, First. and they were ingrained with this mentality, it's very, very uh, important when you start a company, uh, and Zuckerberg's words is run fast and break things. We just normally <laughs> run fast and break things, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, in a lot of the relevant Czech army units, that's the mentality there, because you don't have any other options. Uh, and I think as Israelis, we're very, very good at finding solutions. We're very, very good at uh, building technology that will solve uh, a particular problem. What we're very, very bad at is identifying relevant problems and building a business model around them, which is something that Americans are usually very good at. If you look at maybe an example from our market, we have several competitors that uh, leverage a similar business model. All of our American competitors have Terrific marketing, terrific sales, just a lousy technology below that. And when we started, and uh, one of our other uh, Israeli competitors in that space, we have really great tech, really terrible sales and marketing. <laughs> and so I moved to, to the US three years ago, uh, so I'm not sure I qualify for an Israeli-American yet. I'm still being <laughs> Americanized. Uh, but someone who has been here for 10, 15 years, hopefully can get both the business skills that Americans are good at, and the tech skills, and the kind of entrepreneurship skills that Israelis are very good at and combine them into creating really, really large and successful companies. Interesting. I, I agree with you from, uh, I see that from the tech companies in New York. Maybe Sharon, you from a different sector, not technology, uh, but uh, something different. Do you have a, a different uh, view on that? I think the secret sauce is hummus. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Because in Hebrew you say hummus or שעושים בעבר שלא עושים בכלל. And it's hard to even translate it. Um, but seriously speaking, um, one of the things that really helps us, there are two words. One is chutzpah or chutzpah, and the other one is balagan, which also is very hard to translate. I think the best way to say it is a mess, but it's not really a mess. Um, from, in biotech, if you're in the Cambridge area, which is the biggest hub for biotech in the world, and, and it's really a, a beautiful place to be with and develop drug, there is a very specific protocol on how you start a company. And I would say that probably 90% of the technologies and the new com companies are coming from either MIT or Harvard. And rightly so, there is a lot of great science that is happening there. And the VCs are so embraced into the academia that it's very hard to break it. So if you want to start a company outside of the Harvard Bio, uh, uh, VC group, how do you do that? How do you even start to operate? Um, I, didn't, I came from Tel Aviv University, um, which I think is a great school. 
Um, my first company came ex directly from my PhD thesis into, um, became a company in Israel and then moved to the States and I moved with it. And then when I started this new company, it, I, we believed it was a good idea, but we didn't have the Harvard stamp on our passport. And then I think what's interesting in being Israeli is that you're saying, okay, is that what they want to do? I'll show them that we can do it otherwise. And once we started to get results we, and we wanted to go and do our Series A funding, we realized we need this Harvard stamp. You, we need someone that will vouch, okay, this didn't start at MIT or Harvard, but this is good. And the Israeli chutzpah for my, uh, uh, for my side was I looked at online, I was sitting at Panera one day, looked at all the 20 companies that, have, uh, that are doing oncology in the uh, Boston area, and wrote cold notes. I'm Sharon Shacham, you know, and I, I have this cool science that I think is very important. And um, described the science. I said I would love to work with you. So these were the biggest names in in, in Harvard, Memorial Sloan Catering, MIT. And I wrote about 20 notes. And I have to say, within 24 hours, I got 18 responses. Hmm. Um, the first one that answered me, actually, I said, you know what, I'm going to Israel, let's talk after. I said, no, I want to talk to you, I love working with Israeli. I will call you, I'm awake every day at 4 a.m., I will call you in Israel. And he became one of the founder of the company. His name was Ron DePino. Later, after that, he became the president of MD Anderson. So really, can't get much better than that. Um, and, and he was tremendous to, the, um, to set the company to, uh, to help us with the Series A funding and eventually after that to help with the company getting public. Um, and I think with this was the two essence of breaking the protocol because for us, if there is a process, it's mostly to break it and immediately move to another process. And the other one is not to be afraid and have the Israeli chutzpah to feel comfortable in talking to anyone eye to eye and saying, you know, we think this is a smart idea, let's work together. Well, I think the secret sauce can be best summarized with uh, saying of Robert Kennedy who said once that some people like to ask why. I'd rather ask why not. And I think that Israelis are constantly busy asking the why not question. And that is a very, very powerful question to ask when you try to build a company, when you try to solve a really, really big problem. It kind of forces you to think outside the box. And that's what I believe when we talk, talk to the Israelis that we see that time and time again, this outside the box thinking. A lot of Americans and Europeans, they're too, you know, in the, they're thinking inside the box quite often. They're not thinking outside and the solutions quite often to big problems cannot be found within the same level of thinking. And I think the Israelis are really, really good at that. I think the other one is that these guys are just not willing to accept no for an answer. Try to tell them no. Try to tell them no, I'm not going to fund your business. Fund your business. Try to tell them no, this, this thing cannot work in your market. They'll go back, they'll figure it out, they'll be persistent, they'll nag you. But something happens when you have that passion, that conviction in your product, seeing that they know how to market it, obviously, right? There is this, there's this also notion of not listening. And we'll talk about what Israelis must do more of in order to succeed in this country. But that persistence, not taking no for an answer, chutzpah, hummus, among other things, can be really helpful. All the chet things. All the Thank chet you. Things. Thank you all. Um, you know, we can sit here and talk how, like, how the Israeli innovation is good and all of that. But I want to just mention two facts that will connect it to the reality in New York, for example. So uh, uh, three out of the five uh, popular transportation apps that every New Yorker is using on a daily basis are Israelis, if it's uh, Get, Juno, and Via. The other two are Lyft and Uber. And one of the three acquired the other a few months ago for $200 million, where Get acquired for $200 million uh, Juno. So I think this is an amazing fact. So from all over the world, three out of the five are Israelis. Another fact is that- The head of growth for Lyft is also an Israeli. Really? Oh, that I didn't know that. So maybe three and a half out of, out of the five. And, and, and the company that started this whole thing and lost. 
was also Israeli. I know, yes, right. your partner. Uh, Daniel's partner, who should be in the panel, uh, Alex Mashinsky, he, he built a, a company exactly like Uber, but he was uh, ahead should of talk, time. Should like, we talk about failures now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then uh, the second fact, it's an inter inter interesting fact, is that uh, although there are only 350, not only, 350 Israeli startups in New York among 7,000, which is 5%, uh, in 2016, five out of the largest 10 financing grounds of all the startups in New York City are of Israeli startups, which is an amazing fact. Like 50% of the largest uh, 10 financing grounds of Israeli startups, although we are only 5% in total in the number in, uh, in the New York ecosystem, which is an amazing for the Israeli uh, technology and innovation. Um, that uh, gets me into the uh, next question. A lot of entrepreneurs, as we said, coming to the US and they are debating where to go, New York, San Francisco, Boston maybe. Um, Michael, as someone that was in Tel Aviv, San Francisco, New York, what do you think should be uh, the criteria for an entrepreneur that moved to New York, where to, which place to choose, to, uh, to, to the US, of course, which place to choose uh, so I think for his company? Th there, are, there are a lot of different criteria each company has when selecting where to move. But unfortunately, probably until three years ago, if you were an Israeli startup, you got American VCs who are mostly from the Silicon Valley. The playbook was you move your headquarters to the Silicon Valley because this is where the money is, the talent is, the market is, and so on. And probably most, if you would start at that map in Silicon Valley, you would have way greater numbers. And I think in recent, years, maybe ad tech moved to ad tech and fashion moved to New York because it was such a strong hub there. But in recent years, it started to change because from my perspective to your why not question, you need to have a really, really good answer why not to move to New York and not the other way around because if you're an Israeli company, you have the seven hour difference instead of a 10 hour difference is a huge impact on your uh, to process work. to work between the two offices, right? Having two or three hours in common when you can actually share ideas and communicate versus half a day. The 10 hour flight versus now the direct one, although it's United, so uh, an 18, 18 hour flight that you would have from Silicon Valley, that's an extra day almost flying uh, every time. Right. Uh, and the Israeli community in, uh, in New York is so much better. So it's, it helps you personally and it helps you uh, hiring people and collaborate with people way more than in the Valley. Now, there are specific fields that if you sell into tech, you probably want to move to the Valley because that's where your customers are. Even taking a step back here, the main reason you should move as an Israeli founder, you should move from Israel to the US is if your customers are in the US and if your ecosystem that you're building the company around is in the US, mm -hmm. then figure out where in the US it is and move there. Not this automatic go to the Valley because that's where it's more, more comfortable for the VCs to be in. Uh, Luckily, we moved uh, right after we closed our second round, and our second VC was NEA, who has an office both in the East Coast and in the West Coast, so it was easier to convince them. But uh, in our perspective, right, that we sell into retail and we, we work with the financial sector. They're all in New York, and the ones that are not in New York are somewhere in the East Coast. None of them are in SF. So it was, in retrospect, a really silly move. Uh, so we, we corrected that and we moved about a year ago, we moved from Silicon Valley back to New York and it's been working substantially better, both in the com communicating to Israel, leveraging the people we have in Israel to help uh, the US, getting back the feedback we're getting from the market back to the, to the dev team and just working with our customers. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, you have a technology company and uh, based on all the database that I have, in New York, 99% of the companies are technology companies. And in the map I created in uh, Boston, 50% are technology, and the other 50, it's a uh, medical device, clean tech, pharma. So maybe this is the answer why uh, Boston? I, I think in the, in the biotech, um, Boston is, um, it's probably one of the two options you have, um, which is either in Silicon Valley or, or in the Boston area. You, in order to be, again, connected to academia, to connect it to the hospitals, um, and connected to um, 
the other institution in, in order that it, mm -hmm. to need drug development, you need to be in Boston. And also most of the talent, or a lot of the talent, is sitting in, in Boston. It makes it very difficult because it's a very competitive field in order to keep your employees. Um, but the, the talent you have there is great. I would mention one thing interesting that we learn in our company, uh, in which, uh, as a company of Israelis, that is doing a lot of work um, that is based in Boston and doing a lot of work in the US, Europe, and Israel. The interesting thing that we learned, and it took us a long time to learn, I admit, is that for the European operation, the best place to be is in Israel. Mm -hmm. So um, we have an office in, in Germany, um, and we thought this will be our center to do clinical studies, uh, clinical studies in, in Europe, but then we learned that if we want to get the talent and we want to get the culture and the fit to America, we are now moving our operation in Europe to Israel. And, and, and that there comes that we have finally a direct flight from Israel to Boston, and the seven hour difference makes a play, and being on the East Coast really helps. Thank you. Daniel, maybe as an invest, from the investor side, when you see companies, it's matter to you where they are located, or where well, they are moving, or? They should be located where they can be most successful, right? And it's quite often a balance between talent and capital. Now, it used to be that San Francisco had both, right? A lot of capital and tremendous talent. But what we've seen the last few years um, with New York, with the ecosystem that has been built there, especially after the crisis of 2008, we're seeing a lot of great talent coming to New York City. The new tech, uh, Cornell, uh, right, the Cornell? Techno Cornell. Techno yes. Cornell University that is being built uh, in New York is going to provide flood of uh, great engineers. And we're seeing a lot of VCs, and it's already happening, um, forming their offices and moving some offices from San Francisco and from Chicago and from Boston to New York City making New York in an ideal place where Israeli startups can be, especially like Michael said. It's that, that 10 hour difference versus seven hour difference. You have to, when you go to the office, your dev team is going home. And when they get to the office, you're going to sleep. So it's extremely difficult to manage a company like this. So when the excuse was, that when the capital was there, when the talent was there, go to San Francisco, win. But now with New York, where most of the customers, you know, in FinTech and fashion and Whatever other industry you're looking at, I think making New York a great choice for Israelis. Thank you. Uh, I would like to mention another uh, fact. New guy, Franklin. Come on. I mean, seriously. <laughs> uh, I would like to mention another interesting fact that in the recent, uh, I would say, uh, three years, there's a new trend in New York of investors. It was not exist before. Investors that invest only in Israeli startups. I think the first one was uh, Joy Lowe from Star Farm Ventures. He is among the first investors in uh, WeWork and in Tabula of Adams and Golda and in, in, in additional uh, around uh, 30 Israeli startups. Uh, then uh, there is an, um, New York Angels. It's 130 New York-based angels. And in this organization, they established the Israeli committee, the New York Angels. 30 uh, angels that invest and promote Israeli startups among the uh, bigger organization of the uh, New York Angels. There's also a Cornerstone Ventures who invest in Israeli startups and uh, GD, Governing Dynamics, mm -hmm. which investing in Israeli startups and uh, even uh, the, there is an Israeli syndicate in Angelist, which means that a lot of angel investors get together as a group and invest only in Israeli startups which I think is uh, an amazing trend, which uh, shows also how, the, how mature the Israeli uh, startup community is. And uh, if I would say that until uh, two, three years ago, we saw a lot of uh, ad tech, media, video companies expanding from Israel to New York. And I'm saying expanding because uh, uh, it's not mo they're moving. Usually the R&D stays in Israel. One of the founders is expanding to uh, the US to build uh, the team with the marketing, sales, some business development. And uh, so if we saw a lot of these companies in the recent two years, we see more fintech companies, cyber, uh, big data, analytics. And uh, this question is to Daniel with uh, your new company, Celsius, which deal with blockchain. 
Is this the new trend? What we see on that? What do you see in uh, this sector in the US, in New York specific? I'm sure everyone would like to, to, to hear about the blockchain. You gotta promise me that you're not gonna use anything I'm gonna say to buy Bitcoin after this session. One sec. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> or to short Bitcoin. <laughs> um, look, for some of us it feels like 1994 when the internet started. Obviously it started a bit before, but at least at a trend. Um, to talk about blockchain, I will need a few hours. I, um, I can summarize it by, it's that um, shitty database you use when you don't trust anyone. And another way of looking at it is, uh, is a network that connect consumers uh, to other consumers and businesses without the need of a central point, a, cent a middleman. If you'd like to learn more about blockchain, if you've got Netflix, go watch the movie Blocking on Bitcoin, Banking on Bitcoin. I think that's uh, it's a tremendous movie that can give you guys the history of what's happening here. But to answer Guy's question, we believe that blockchain is the future um, because it will impact our lives in so many different ways. Um, some that are, for now at least, are hard to see. But there is the tendency with Facebook and Google and the government and big banks owning, controlling so much of that data, our data, that is not necessarily a good thing for us. Um, so we believe in what we're seeing coming out of Israel. We're seeing a lot of great developers, a lot of great companies um, are starting to leverage blockchain, blockchain technologies for various use cases. Uh, there are limited use cases that currently can be used on blockchain because blockchain, the Ethereum network, is not as scalable right now. Um, so Visa is processing tw some 20 million transactions per second. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's close to that number. Uh, Western Union, almost 17,000. The number of transactions that you can do on the Ethereum network is seven a second. So it will take years before blockchain can be rely upon to build services and consumer applications that are scalable. But when that time comes, and it will come in two years from today or three years from today, we believe, at least from where we sit as an entrepreneurs and investors, that life won't be the same. And it will impact our lives and the way that we engage with governments and cities and our medical records um, and real estate, you name it. Everything will be built on blockchain technology. The, the, the opportunity is tremendous. I would, um, Bitcoin is one thing. Blockchain is the, the infrastructure, the technology in which Bitcoin is kind of operating. Um, for now, it's, there's a lot of speculation in the space, but the technology is solid and will be with us for centuries to come. Interesting. Good luck with the Celsius. Um, there are so many Israeli entrepreneurs, as we said, moving to the US, starting a new startup every year. Like I think it's like thousands of uh, new <coughs> entrepreneurs. From your experience, what is your advice to Israeli entrepreneurs that would like to get into the tech industry in general and also in uh, the US? So Israeli founders in Israel, Israeli, Israeli non-founders moving here? Mainly Israeli entrepreneurs that are moving here. Mm -hmm. Also in general, if you have any advice, but more that are moving to here based on our, all of us, our experience, 20 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. three years. So I have right, an experience of one. Uh, one company, three years, I don't know. Uh, we haven't succeeded yet, we're just on our path there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think the first thing Israelis need to understand, especially moving to New York, but probably in SF and other places, in Boston as well, there's a huge community you can leverage. The first thing, plug yourself in, talk to a person like a guy, right? We talked before I moved. Ah, exactly. Oh. Right? We talked before <coughs> I moved. Actually, that's funny because like uh, now, as we said, you raised $50 million, you're a successful company, but uh, I think it was four years ago we met at one of these conferences in New York. You were the VP at Pango. Yep. It was the VP at Pango and he told me, oh, I have this idea and I'm going to, he didn't tell me too much about it, but he's going to start a new startup and all of that. I remember we sit in one yeah. of the conference rooms and after a few months, he established the company. And you know, the failure, it's only one out of 10, even not this, like succeed. Mm -hmm. And the, the journey that Michael did since then, I think it's really amazing, really. So, uh, thank you. Congrats. Uh, but it's a plug yourself to the network. 
I mean, part of the reason I think the IAC in general and all they're trying to do is make a global network out of it, I mean, or at least a nationwide network out of it. Right. But at, at the very least, plug yourself to the local network you've decided to move on to. Uh, both the New York, Boston, and SF has a lot of people that have done that, a lot of people that work for large companies, a lot of people that will be able to share uh, their experience with, open up their connections and share, uh, kind of help you establish yourself there. I'm assuming that the question addresses to people that already started something in Israel and they're coming here. Oh. Um, and the second thing is we found that most non-Israelis have a lot of respect towards Israeli founders. If you're talking to VCs, if you're talking to corporates you want to work with, uh, definitely in the cyberspace or in anything related to cyber, the moment you say, and I encourage anyone in the, in the, the, who served in intelligence just to give up and say, yeah, I wasn't 8200, because explaining them the different <laughs> units just doesn't help. Uh, I gave up on that. Uh, so leverage the good reputation Israel has and leveraging uh, the, the network. Right? You've mentioned, you mentioned specific investors that target Israel, but even those that don't understand that a lot of really great companies and really great tech comes from it. Uh, I also think, on the point that I touched earlier, then everyone respects Israeli tech, but not so much the Israeli sales abilities. When you're going to an investor, they always ask themselves, an investor here, and ask themselves the question of why am I so lucky to see that deal and have the opportunity to invest? <laughs> and I've always found that it's very, very good to explain, to, to show them why they can contribute to what, they have something unique that you don't and they can supplement that. So when you come in as an Israeli, you tell, look, I know nothing about the American market. I know nothing about how to sell. My first impression here hiring salespeople was all American salespeople are really, really, really good at selling themselves and only a small fraction of them are capable of selling other stuff. And, and, and that was from my perspective, right? So you need someone who's experienced at that to help you. Uh, don't think that just because you're an Israeli and you know everything, exactly. there are a few things that you, you don't just map them out, accept that and look for people that can help you with this. It'll make them more engaged to you. Mm -hmm. People like helping other people. Correct. Uh, it almost surprised me how much people like helping other people. Uh, I mean, I like fundraising because you just get a lot of help through all the investors you meet. I know a lot of people think it's a bad experience. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I think, no, I think helping, I think I see it in New York. The people really love to help each other. Not in order to get something out of that, but to help. It's and, a community, uh, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's all, it's all about the community. I, I agree. Uh, so you on. need to remember not to be in a panel with three. I'm the only one from Boston, and I'm with three New Yorkers. <laughs> but, uh, it, is, uh, <laughs> but, it was in San Francisco. So. I agree that the network is, is super important and super helpful. Um, also, I think Israelis are more willing to take risk. Mm -hmm. at the early stage, they, um, they feel more comfortable and they will find creative ways to help you. Um, other in, in my field, doing services in kind, um, or in, in taking options instead of getting your salaries. And they, I, when I started the company before we did the Series A funding, there were about 20 people that were helping the company and, and most of them were Israelis. I think what we need to be careful is um, to know what we are good at and what we are missing. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is something that we really don't like. You know, we don't like processes, we don't like standard operating procedures, we don't like um, waiting. We <laughs> Systems, <laughs> and, <laughs> and our company is 150 people and for example, the to deal with the FDA, to deal with the government agencies. This is not the place you want to plug your most uh, aggressive Israelis. Um, <laughs> Understand it. Because you need people that um, will, will be able to follow. So, so in, every, in every business there is the part that you move from innovating high risk, high speed, especially in biotech, in which it's, it's all about the science and the innovation, to, probably the most regulated field in which it's all about FDA and other health authorities and hospitals and ethics committees and you have to be the super careful and you have to find the balance because I think part of the problem is that you move to be very slow in the late stage of the drug development. The Israelis will move it faster 
but you have to have the right balance of the people that understand. Um, that's one thing. Um, and the other one is we need to remember that our mannerism is a bit different than other people. Um, the company has, in, in my company, there are people from 20 different countries, and they always think we hate each other. The 10 <laughs> Israelis in the company, they're sure we hate each other because we scream at each other all the time. Um, and it's a bit scary to them when they come out of the conference room and they're saying, was this a good meeting? Oh, it was a great meeting. <laughs> so we made so many decisions, and then we hug, and we go. So, so, so as you expand and, and you reach out, we need to be um, more open-minded, especially in a place like in the US when there are so many countries and so many cultures to other how people like to, to do their businesses. So I guess I can add just one story is that um, and we see it often, right? We, we talk to these entrepreneurs, especially who just raised money in Israel and they come to the United States and have got all the confidence, like, you know, I just raised $4 million and they expect the red carpet to just be there just as if Trump, again, you're way more modest to a lot of people that we meet. And, then you tell them, you know, you may want to consider to hire an American marketing person or an American, American salesperson. They're like, tough, 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 tough. <laughs> tough, 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 tough. Now you're going to listen to me. I'm like, you know, you, you came here to this meeting to hopefully raise another run for me. I'm not so sure that this thing is going to work if you think you're going to come here and know it all. Right? Israel is an amazing country. We've got strengths, but we also have weaknesses, especially behavioral ones. And that these, those behavioral weaknesses are just not going to go well with Americans. And at the end of the day, you can have the most amazing products that can solve the most critical problem. If somebody doesn't know that you exist, you just spend all this money on R&D, and then what? And at the end of the day, the market is here. The market is in Europe. And in Rome, just behave like a Roman. Um, You've you got to listen. The fact that you raise money in Israel and you've built this great product is just not enough. And that when we look to invest in entrepreneurs, we are looking for some sense of humility. At least when it comes to, okay, I just landed in, in this new country. And no, I don't know it all. And yes, I need help. And it's amazing, like Michael said, what, what happens when you ask for help in certain areas, when you say, I just, I'm not good at that specific thing. Um, so just listen more, understand that you've got some strengths and weaknesses, and understand that the best thing you can do is to mitigate those weaknesses by working with people who've done this before, who've lived, it, who've lived here, and have been successful. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Part of uh, humility uh, teaches me, <laughs> no, no, making a specific point about diversity. I mean, pe people in Israel don't realize how diverse the world is. And the U.S. is a, kind of a, gives you one probably order of magnitude on diversity before you move to the actual world. But I remember in our Series B funding deck, I had a slide that said that part of the advantages of why our system is so good is because we have a very diverse team. And the investor looks at me, and I don't understand. You are all a bunch of white Jewish young army guys. There's nothing. It's the least diverse group I've ever seen. Uh, and, and from an Israeli perspective, you think because you know all the nuances in the Israeli society how diverse you are. <laughs> Send me the slide. <laughs> Copy me too. Thank you for these uh, advices. We are now getting into our uh, last question before uh, uh, the Q&A. The last question relates to failures, uh, because I think, and I see it in Israel, indeed, that Israelis never fail. <laughs> in Israel, a failure is OK. A lot of entrepreneurs try to uh, build a few startups, failed, start a with a new idea, try to raise money, even then, if they failed, then they come to invest to an investor. The investor see their CV, and if it's an Israeli investor, he said, "Oh, it's good. You tried twice. You failed." So sometimes, from an Israeli perspective, it's good. In the U.S., uh, the perspective is a little bit different. What's your view on that? Maybe we'll start from Daniel this time. <coughs> um, look, one of the. VCs that I most respect, Fred Wilson said that, you know, you should be wearing your failures as a badge of honor. 
right? You, you don't, if you don't fail, you don't push yourself hard enough. And there's just no way of building these companies without pushing as hard as you can. And you accept that some things are just not going to work. Nine out of 10 will fail. Um, and I do feel that, again, from the ecosystem that, that we're a part of uh, in New York, uh, there is this acceptance that it's okay to fail. Not only okay, it's almost a requirement that you've worked for a company uh, that have failed. It's better off to come out of Google, granted, um, or to have run a, a successful company, absolutely, but at the same time, we don't see anything wrong with failures. I failed far more than I've succeeded. Alex Mashinsky passed on Google, was giving a chance to, to invest in Google when uh, the founders were looking for $100,000. We had our biggest failure with Groundlink. In 2008, we had the first mobile app that would allow you to dispatch cars, 2008 and 2010. Um, this was our biggest failure. It, it's, it's totally fine to have failed and we're actually looking at it in a, in a positive way. The question is not the failures. What have you learned? What are you going to do differently this time because of that failure? Thank you. So on. I think with failure, look, in biotech, one, or oh, in pharma, one out of 20 drugs that are getting into clinical trials will be approved. So your failure rate is 95%. So, there is kind of understanding that this is an industry of failure. I do think as Israelis, we are much more equipped to deal with failure. Um, if, if you, uh, it's, uh, we actually see it as a challenge, and we also has, we'll, we'll show them that we can succeed. Okay, we failed once, but this time we, will, we have to show everybody that we can do it. And if they'll not let us go through the door, we'll find a window, or we find another Israeli that will help us break the door. But we will get in. So, um, in the U.S., I think there is one, it, it's a big country, so if you fail, you also have the ability to go into other VCs, go into other funds. Uh, so in, in a, I think there is a, a room for second chance, and, and you're also more anonymous. Um, I think every time we hear about the, you know, we like the success, but also when we hear one of our colleagues' startup is closed, we all get it on the WhatsApp in like five minutes. By the way, did you hear that this and this uh, didn't make it? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> gossip is, is something that we are very busy. So you do wear your failures very much up front, and that, I think, brings this, okay, I will show them that next time I can do it. In the U.S., you know, you failed here, now you're moving. You, there are hundreds and thousands of other firms that, that will work with you. And, and I think if you present your failure in a way that um, it was a lesson learning, um, that you did it, that you've learned from it, and as we, I think, mentioned before, the, the humility of saying, okay, I've been there, they'll appreciate that. I don't think it will uh, have a bad impact. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you about the, that you learned from that lesson. And uh, I will mention the fact that uh, in the last four years, around 60 Israeli startups shut down their operations in New York. Most of them are Israelis. But not in Boston. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in New York, these 60 Israeli startups, most of them are Israeli entrepreneurs live in New York before they build their company. It's not that they moved from uh, other state or Israel. Then they then build a company, which means that the statistics is against them, like any other entrepreneurs. But a lot of them started a new startup, because I'm tracking it for the last four years, yeah. and I see that a lot of them started a new startup, a new idea, and others became uh, executives in some other startups. So everyone is keep going and uh, trying for his uh, next challenge, which is amazing. Um, this is the stage, the uh, time that we will want to open it uh, uh, the discussion for Q&A from uh, the audience, so... Uh, you guys have microphones over there, so if you want to... Yeah, there's a microphone over there, but you can try without a microphone, maybe... Uh, Let's try it out, yeah, go ahead. Tali, maybe you want to end, end it? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> The exit, most common exit path is to sell the company, return the money to the investor, and then move on. 
uh, most of the exits are selling the company to an American company. Um, what do you think about uh, the scenario where uh, investors in Israeli companies would be more patient and take it to the route of a public offering, like Cario Farm ended up, and basically build a sustainable Israeli company like Amdocs, Teva, the next big company that will represent Israel and be listed on NASDAQ, rather than sell it to an American company? I don't know. I, I may have a contrarian view on this, but I, the, the first thing, I don't think Israeli sells, sell their companies earlier than Americans. We're just so focused on it in the Israeli media. That's right. uh, if you look at the statistics of exits in the U.S., one and a half percent, sorry, half a percent of the, I just remember, half a percent of the U.S. startups that raise the Series A, so not a seed, it's already a more established company, go public. And about 20% of those have some exit. So it's a, right, it's a 40 to 1 ratio. I don't think it's very different in Israel. Scale may be different. The problems we're often dealing with are different because we're, only, we're oftentimes looking at the market from an Israeli scale. But it kind of reminds me this, from, from my perspective, it's an, kind of a media obsession of when will Israelis grow big companies. And it reminds me of a story when everyone was talking about when will Israel have the next Nokia? I'm really, really glad that we didn't build a Nokia because now the Finland economy is being ruined because there's no more Nokia. There's some external event that they, know how, they don't know how to build others. What we're very good at in Israel is there is a hundred different startups and they're always, some of them are successful, some of them are, are not and then there are their foundations of bigger companies. I think that when you're considering whether you should sell or not, it's what will be, how far can this business be taken to? There's no limit of capital, definitely not in today's market. For, like, none of our investors are Israeli investors. Their funds are for 12, 14 years. They don't care about the specific example, but if the time will come when we'll have to decide to sell, it'll be because that's, we've reached the potential of where we can take that particular company in the market. And I think a lot of the Israeli companies, the reason they sell what we would say, what you would say too early is because they build a tech but they didn't build the distribution for that tech, and they need to leverage someone else's distribution, like IBM or Cisco, that are one of the more active acquirers, and then combine between that excellent distribution and that tech and monetize and create a larger business out of it rather than trying to sell on itself. Look, you're also seeing um, a second, third time entrepreneurs that are now are okay and prefer to build bigger companies. I remember Yossi Verdi a while ago said there was this debate a DLD, is it okay or uh, just to sell too early? There was a data that is, goes against what you, Michael, uh, presented maybe it was um, a few years ago that Israelis used to sell, you know, at 40 to 50 million and just move on to the next thing. Um, but what we're seeing today is there are more experienced Israeli entrepreneurs who've built businesses who are fine financially, but they bought their apartment in Tel Aviv, everything is okay, uh, preferring to not to sell that quickly, preferring to go and build, build bigger and bigger companies. It doesn't have to be Nokia, but big, and, and you, you look, and we did a very interesting study, you look at the number of unicorns, company that, whose value was, which value was above a billion dollars, Israel is number one, however you cut the data. That was not the case five years ago, that was not the case 10 years ago, it is the case today. And that's very encouraging, not only for entrepreneurs, but for the Israeli economy that gets some of that money back in taxes. I, I think it's also important to build company and to expand the knowledge that we have in Israel. Um, in, 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 I think the, uh, there's a lot of knowledge in the early stage of companies in Israel. Um, as, as not many companies do it all the way uh, and building, um, the leadership skill in Israel are somehow limited, especially in pharma and biotech. If you want to learn how to be a manager, if you want to learn manufacturing, regulatory, or other fields that are related to drug development, you have to work with Teva or you have to move to the US. Um, and if you want to expand and really make Israel the biotech hub like it's the high tech hub, we have to have more Israeli companies and, and more Israelis learning these skills building companies and then moving back and doing the same uh, in Israel. Other questions? Yes. Hi, um, can you talk a little bit about failure? As Americans, we have a pretty negative association with failure, whether it's in our business lives, personal lives, family lives, and what do you think it is about Israelis that are okay with failing? 
So I think we, when they, they covered this, I, I might have a different perspective. My personal experience is almost the opposite. Maybe it has to do with the segmentation. So the people, I, the Americans I meet are mostly tech founders. Mm -hmm. And in that community, failure is almost idolized. You want to fail fast. How many failures did you have? How many money have, how much <laughs> money have you raised from investors and raised it with a Z? And uh, it's more acceptable, I think, Failure in that perspective is the opposite of perseverance. If you talk to Israelis, they're like, no way I'm failing. They're very emotional about this. I'm going to succeed to the same of, I'll, I'll find the way in. And sometimes I'll just define the success criteria as a little different <laughs> and I'll it, to convince myself that I'm still going in the right, or in, the, in, the, in the original direction. So I actually don't think the people that are in the tech ecosystem in the US have a worse reaction to failure, maybe in, kind of corporate America environment, uh, but not, not from my experience. I don't know if it's different yeah. reaction. Yeah. It's almost more customary, because these companies do fail, and fail at a higher percentage. In right? Israel? No, in, in general. Yeah. yeah. But I also think it's a little bit in our gene. If, if you'll take the, um, the American kid, a success will be only if he finish high school with amazing scores and move into an IV league, mm -hmm. um, college. We have a much more open uh, idea of how we define um, our life and how do we accumulate experiences. Um, if the kid doesn't want to go to college and, you know, we always have the army that will reset everybody anyway. Um, but after that, if you want to experience being a surfer dude for three years and then following, then you're going to uh, visit the world and, and throughout these experiences and only then when you are about 25 you're thinking okay maybe I should go to school at some point in my life. It's all okay and throughout this experience of different aspect of life we accumulate many failures. Uh, we struggle more and I think it makes us much more flexible to, um, to get into this point of failure, learn from it and, and move on. The other thing that you may want to try is not to care what people think. You know, you get to a point in life, all right, it's okay. You, you know who you are. And when you're not bothered too much with what other people may say or think about you, uh, it's a very relieving experience. I think that's actually something Israelis are better than Americans. Exactly. I mean, to your point, in my circles, the biggest badge of honor you can have is becoming a Harvard dropout. That, that's <laughs> way more than any other degree you can. Exactly. Other questions? I think we're running out of time. Uh, two more questions. Listening to the panel, one would assume that um, all the entrepreneurial activity that's happening connected to Israelis is happening on the coast, which is not true. I'm coming from Michigan. And if you look at cybersecurity, which is very tied to the automotive industry, there's a lot of activity of that happening in Michigan. I'm connected with the Israeli community in Chicago. There's a lot there. Talk to us about what you know about Israelis branching out into middle America. I actually wanted to mention that at the beginning, because I think there is a, a big hub in North Carolina of biotech Correct. and Israeli nice. biotechs. Uh, Houston is becoming a big ba uh, um, hub for biotech as well. I think it's now the second in the US or the third. And there are many, many Israelis, um, a lot of MDs and PhD that are working through this institution. And also the state is very open mind to support funding uh, in Texas. So we do see um, other um, biotech now springing in different areas of the country. Yeah. But I think it, it also has to do with where your market is. Exactly. And one of our customers is in Columbus, Ohio, because they're selling into specific retailers, and there's a lot of retail there. And another one of our customers that's also kind of half an Israeli company is in Chicago, because there's, like, it, it's smart for you to go to places that are close to your market. You mentioned the cybersecurity for the auto industry. Naturally, you have to be there. Uh, in, when, you, but when you look at the US economy, it's mostly on the coast. So it's where most of the Israeli startups go to. You don't have to. I think a big advantage that we're seeing for middle America, kind of non-coastal non cities, is if you actually need engineering talent. So all of our engineering teams in Tel Aviv, and so we don't need to compete with engineers in 
Silicon yeah. Valley or in New York. It's difficult. But a lot of, if you do need engineering talent, finding it in Pittsburgh or finding it in Ann Arbor or finding it somewhere, uh, Austin is actually becoming a tough market now, but maybe Salt Lake City is way easier than on the coast. Two more, I guess, two. One. <coughs> There's a council member over there with a question, right? Hello, uh, my name is Gabriel Avila. I'm from an investing and consulting group um, called Tamid. It's very popular in the big schools you guys mentioned, as well as the upper tier schools, such as uh, American University. So my question to you guys would be, what part do Israeli youth or Israeli Americans, students really, play in the startup nation sphere of uh, the economic world? So maybe I'll take that. We had, but so far, four, uh, completely American, non-Israeli students come to our office in Israel to be interns over the summer. Uh, and it was very, very successful experience both for us and for them. Uh, and we, specifically in Israel, we hire a lot of kids that are high school graduates before they go to the army. Uh, also a very successful experience for us. We will be, our office in New York is not big enough yet, so there's not enough attention we can give uh, students, but I'm hoping based on the positive experiences we had, that the moment we grow a little and we'll have more people, uh, we'll be able to, to leverage that again, because I think it's a really, really great experience and great advantage for both sides. What's the other question? Hello, uh, my name is Jerry Savoni. I'm uh, from the South Florida region, and uh, in the last few years, we're really developing an amazing ecosystem in uh, Miami. Uh, and we had like, two big conferences that we brought a lot of Israeli, it's called Startup Nation Conference, and we had a phenomenal uh, attraction from it. Uh, really interesting companies came, and there's a lot of hype in the cybersecurity space. In Miami, one of the biggest deal happened in, was 1.2 billion uh, in cybersecurity project there. Uh, we're working with another one right now with a big company, Cyberbit, which is an Israeli company. Uh, and there's a lot of ventures capital, family offices that really love that space. Uh, but we have a lot of Israelis that are trying to come to this market and they have a lot of issues from a marketing standpoint, like you said. They think they have it all uh, and they have the right pitch and they don't really know how to position themselves with investors and, and what to say and what the parameters that really VCs are looking for. So what I will really would love to hear from you is kind of like if you can map out the most important things that really the Israeli, the entrepreneurs needs to have. And additional to that is, is it important for them to have a location in the US? And I think it's super, super important. Go for it. Then, well, once again, I have a, an example, an experience of one. Uh, and from my perspective is, you need to tailor your pitch towards your business and some businesses, I'll say, yes, if you're selling into a specific segment, you need to be there and you need to already show the traction with the executives in your industry in other places. Actually, I'll, I'll scratch all of that. Never take no for an answer. So when an investor tells you you have to do this to be successful, listen, think by yourself of whether it's true or not, or whether it applies to your business or not, and then execute on this. When we started, so the last time I wrote any code was probably 20 years ago. So we had no technical co-founder among the three of us. And people in Israel told us, without a technical co-founder, you will never raise any money. We got five term sheets after three weeks of fundraising. So it's, it's we, because we were really, really strong at other aspects. And you really need to understand. The problem is general advice. Is there general? And <laughs> almost by definition, that will be wrong for everyone. You really need to think by yourself or what applies to your business. I have a friend who runs a great cybersecurity company. I just met him a few days ago and his sales office is in Miami and it's really, really working great for them. A gateway to Latin America, probably the talent there is half the price if you compare it to the big coastal cities. But it's working for them and it, won't be, it wouldn't work for us because it's so far remote from all the retail we need to sell in the Upper East, uh, kind of Northeast. Uh, th thank you, everyone. I would like to thank the... I would like to say, say again thank you for the IAC, for this amazing conference, and for Tali for putting this uh, uh, panel together. I would like uh, to thank...
Also, uh, Judith Feinstein is doing Judith an amazing uh, job in uh, New York amazing. for the IAC. And uh, thank you all.